Okay. I want to say thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Um, it's going to be a great day. Uh, I'm going to go through um, what I consider to be the very heart of my material. And uh, people ask me a lot, they say, you put out a lot of material on your website. What is the main thing? If, if, you had a, if you had to tell me the main thing that I should check out, if I check out nothing else that's up there, what would it be? And I always tell them the same thing. It's the material on natural law. If, uh, if nothing else, that's the material that you need to understand deeply. So that's what we're going to be covering here today uh, in an extended uh, presentation format. I want to go through uh, a few things before we actually get started. So I call this section before we begin. And uh, the word begin is actually important here because that's really what this presentation is actually about. It's initiation. This is an initiation into really, really deep esoteric material that has been hidden from humanity for millennia. So I just want to ask people before we get started, how many of you are new or relatively new to my work? By a show of hands, please. That's excellent. This is great. That is great news. I am so glad to hear that. Okay? I, what I actually didn't want is to come here and talk to a bunch of people who are already totally f familiar with my work and have already heard it. So this is great. Okay? Um, how many of you here today feel that the human condition and life on earth for humanity right now is tolerable just the way that it is by a show of hands? That's also pretty good because if that was the case, I was going to say, there's nothing for you here today. There's the door. <laughs> okay? So that's good. That We're all hungry for change. Uh, one of the things, one of the big complaints I hear about uh, my work uh, when I check in on forums or something or read some YouTube comments, many people will say, there's nothing new here. I've heard this before somewhere else. Uh, this person covers this. I've read this in this book. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. There is nothing new here. I am not going to present anything new. I am not going to present anything that has not actually been in existence and will continue to be in existence. I'm not making up new material. I, I call myself, I, I would refer to myself, Art uh, said it the other day, actually uh, yesterday when we were having dinner. He, he said, I consider you an aggregator of material. And I love that term. I, I, I love that description of what I do. I, I am an aggregator. I bring things together into a tapestry and then help to explain it in simple and easy to understand terms so that people can readily absorb it, take it in, and then do something with that information. So you will not be seeing or hearing anything new here today, okay? As the old saying goes in, in, in all of the old mystery traditions, there is nothing new under the sun. And what that phrase actually means, many people don't know what that phrase means. It means that the truth, it, it is singular and eternal, Truth has always been here among us, and it will always be, be here. It is our perception that must be aligned with it. So there's nothing new you're going to hear today, okay? It is, these are eternal truths that have always been here among us. Um, another aspect I want to cover before we get started is about my presentation style. This is another thing that I get a lot of complaints about, and it's something that I have no intention of changing. Okay, My presentation style has been described by some as extremely intense and at times even combative. This is a word many people will use to describe my presentation style. Some of you here today are very likely to be angered by some of the things you may hear me say during the duration of this seminar. And I say, so be it. That's okay. If you get angry, that's okay. The fact of the matter is that truth itself, by its very nature, is belligerent. And I'll actually be uh, putting up a quote to that, to that nature uh, later on in the presentation. The reason truth is belligerent is because it actually is, is at war. It's at war with the lie. It's at war with deception. It's at war with mind control. So truth can be belligerent. Many people don't want to hear it when they, when they first encounter it. So um, I tell people all the time, I don't do this, I don't present this information, okay, to be liked. I don't do this to make friends, okay? I'm not interested in making a whole bunch of new friends. If it happens, that's great. 
okay? But that's not the reason I do what I do. I don't do this to be popular. I don't do this to make money. It's not a popularity contest. Telling people many things that they don't want to hear is not going to make you popular or it's not going to make you a whole lot of new friends, okay? So those aren't the reasons I do what I do. To be honest, and I, I tell people this and sometimes they get upset by just hearing this, I don't even really want to do this, okay? I don't want to do this with my life. I don't want to do this with my time, okay? As I already know, understand, and live the information I'm going to present. So I, I get this. I know this, okay? I don't need to keep going over this over and over and over again for my own entertainment, okay? The reason that I actually do this is because I recognize that in a time of such overwhelming ignorance of this critical information, this information which is capable of saving humanity from its current condition, all right? The fact that I do already understand this information places me in a position of moral obligation and responsibility. That's why I do what I do. I'm in a position of moral obligation to speak this information to other people in an effort to help to get them to understand it and live it as well. And that is the reason I do this. Every person here today who wishes to take real world value, practical value from this seminar here today, I'm going to ask them to make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things. The first is try to set aside, to the extent that you are capable of doing so, your perceptions of me as the presenter. Okay, And this includes things like how you think I look, how you think I dress, the sound of my voice, uh, you know, my mannerisms, etc. Try to set those things aside to the extent that you're able to do it. And I know that's difficult for some. And I say this because paying attention to such trivialities will detract your own mental focus away from the information that is being presented today. And that's the worst thing that could happen because it's the information that is important, not me. Try to ignore me and focus on the content, all right? The second thing I ask people to try to do is to be consciously aware of any of your own impulses that you may have here today to immediately reject the information that is being presented in this seminar based solely upon your own initial, initial emotional reaction your initial emotional response to this information, okay? Th this is a logical fallacy, okay? You cannot think with the emotions. So if you hear something you don't like or that angers you, that's okay. Feel the emotion, but don't just immediately say, that can't be true. It's, and, it don't, and don't believe me either. It's about checking it. It's about a process of truth discovery. It's about doing your own due diligence and actually researching this material, okay? But if you try to gauge the veracity, meaning the truthfulness of this information, solely based upon how it makes you feel when hearing it, you are committing a logical fallacy, okay? So I ask people to try, to, try as much as possible to suspend immediate reactions of disbelief, okay, and saying, no, I don't want to accept that, no, it can't be true, based on how something may make you feel that you hear today. That's very important to keep in mind. And lastly, this information, the entire seminar, is a tapestry, okay? It's like pieces of a huge jigsaw puzzle, all right? It is meant to be seen and taken as a whole in its entirety. Now, I know I'm asking a lot here, too, because it's going to be a long day, okay? And my goal here, my work here, is to keep your interest and your attention and your focus throughout the entire course of this seminar. And that's a challenging thing to do. But what I'm asking people is you have to try to see it as a whole because if you, if, if you took the time to be here, and you gave a monetary donation to be here. I'm highly recommending that you stay for the whole duration of the seminar. There's a reason for that. You're only going to get the full tapestry, especially if you're new to my work, by hearing this information in its entirety, okay? So if you don't do that, you'll probably not recognize the patterns, which is what this is all about. That's what this day is all about, pattern recognition, okay? 
that are, that are inherent to this tapestry of information. And more likely than not, you'll have wasted the time that you took to be here today and wasted the money that you spent to be here today. So I don't want anybody to waste their time and their money and their attention, uh, and I don't think you do either. So that's why I, I'm asking people, stay for the whole thing. You'll get the maximum value out of this seminar if you stay for its duration. So with that having been said, let's jump into the material. This presentation is called Natural Law, the real law of attraction and how to apply it in your life. And I, I emphasize that term, real law of attraction. Many people will be familiar with the new age variants of the so-called law or laws of attraction. And this is going to differ quite widely from what people have heard in the new age community and the, in the new age movement regarding what the law or laws of attraction are. These are the real laws of attraction you're going to be hearing today and hopefully understanding today. So let's start in. The first section is about teachability. The teachability of the student, okay? How is, does a student place themselves in the best position to learn? An individual's teachability or their ability to learn by way of being taught by someone else is extremely dependent upon the open-mindedness or closed-mindedness of the individual being taught. Low teachability derives from arrogance and rigid skepticism. But it also derives, low teachability also derives from naivete and gullibility. High teachability, on the other hand, derives from a balance between healthy skepticism and an open-minded willingness to learn and change. So we don't want rigidly skeptical people, okay, that don't have an open mind at all, and we don't want naive and gullible people that will accept everything they're told. We want to, we want to, we want to strike a balance between these two modes. This is called a teachability bell curve, okay? And down here, is uh, the mental state of the student, whether they are, and it goes from arrogance, cynicism, skeptical nature, uh, a teacher, a student, and then up to being trusting, then being gullible, and then being outright naive. Okay, so the, that's the whole spectrum of teachability. The best position to learn is up here at the top of the bell curve. This means you will learn the most if you are here. And that means you're in the balance between teacher and student. It means that you're somewhat skeptical and you're also somewhat trusting. It means that you're able to hold a proposition in your mind without accepting it or rejecting it immediately. It means you will consider the information with an open mind, okay, somewhat trustingly, but also somewhat skeptically. All right, that's going to be the mental state we want to attempt to keep during the duration of this seminar, and therefore you will be in the best position to learn. Of course, as we already said, the poorest positions to learn, the things that, if you're in these mind states in arrogance and rigid skepticism and naivete and gullibility, you're, you're not going to take very much away from this seminar. Okay, so we want to remain at the top of that bell curve if at all possible. Human beings should consider with great care where their information comes from, the source for the information. And this is because by refusing to present certain information and by influencing people to dismiss, to dissuade them from looking into certain information because they're telling you that it's unimportant or unnecessary to consider, many modern institutions like media, like so-called education uh, institutions, are seeking to actually control human perceptions, or let's call it outright what it really is, to control the mind, okay? And therefore, to limit what human beings may even come to understand, and therefore, by limiting what they are coming to understand, they're actually limiting what they're able to do, what they're able to change, what they're able to create, in the world, okay? So very, you have to be skeptical of where your information comes from. And that's why I tell people at the very beginning in my lectures, do not believe me. The worst thing you could do is believe what I'm telling you. 
You need to look into it for yourself. And most of all, you need to do personal introspection to really feel inside of yourself whether this information resonates with truth. Everybody has that intuitive capacity. That also has to be turned on and, and engaged and used. All right? If anybody is coming to this seminar from the perspective of modern, organized, institutional bodies, meaning political thought, political agendas, political organizations, religion, religious thought, religious organizations. I'm talking about organized religion here, okay? What I call scientism, not real science, but scientism, science as set up by institutional bodies to be rigidly skeptical belief systems that blot out anything that could possibly say anything to the contrary of their pre-existing beliefs. I call that scientism, okay? And of course, the New Age movement, which you could group that in with religion. It's just enough. It's for those who don't fall into the religious mindset. This is an alternative religion proposed for them, and they call it the New Age movement. And I tell people, uh, please don't think uh, this is going to uh, concur with any of these belief systems, with any of these boxes for consciousness. This presentation is going to shatter these boxes. It is. It stands outside of all of these because these are limiters for perception and thought. They want to put, place everything in a box, say nothing outside of this box is fit for human consumption, so do, do not go there. And as a result, they act as a mind control influence. The other and biggest limiter of um, of the per human perceptions and the mind, and ultimately of our behavior, is money itself. If you want to talk about the biggest religion, if these, these other religions aren't big enough and powerful enough for you, there's the one that is the ultimate power in the world, the ultimate religion, the god of this world, if you will. Okay? So, what I'm basically saying here is if you're already in a mindset approaching the, uh, let's call it the um, uh, discovery of reality or the exploration of reality from any of these perspectives, you will be sorely disappointed here today by what you're going to hear because the information here falls well outside of any of these institutional limiters for consciousness, okay? The requirements for creating change and the role of knowledge. Let's talk about these concepts for a moment. Human beings everywhere say that they want certain things in their life. And they say that they want certain things to be present for all humanity. Okay, We say we want certain conditions to be present for ourselves and our species as a whole. And, and we, we say we want things such as happiness, health, peace, prosperity, freedom, etc., and all these things are great things to aspire to. And we say we want them. Most people will say and tell you we want these things. All right? However, you know, I don't really feel that they're truly being honest with themselves. Okay? They'll say they want them. But then when you tell them, well, those aren't automatic conditions. They don't just magically manifest. Okay? There are requirements for obtaining these conditions. Okay? And people wouldn't say they want these conditions if these conditions were already omnipresent, right? They're saying that they want something because they don't have it at all, or at least in fullness, right? So when you tell them there's requirements for obtaining them, many people will say, oh, well, you know, I may not be willing to go there. I may not be, I may not want to exert that much effort. And they believe that somehow they're going to magically get these things. Right? Well, this is what the real laws of attraction are about. It's explaining conditions that you want don't just automatically manifest by thinking of them or just having a feeling about them. This is a new age deception. There are requirements for obtaining the conditions that we say we want. Requirement exists in nature. It does exist. If you want something to be different than the way that it already is, than the default conditions, then requirement exists. If you're okay with things being the way that they are now, requirement doesn't exist. 
There are no requirements to creating change. You just accept the default conditions the way they are now and go on with your existence and accept it's going to be this way and possibly get worse. But if you want real change to happen, requirements exist. And this is what many New Age teachers will not tell you or they'll outright deny that requirements exist for creating real change. Specific requirements exist in order for human beings to obtain the conditions that they say they want. If the requirements for obtaining those conditions are not met, those conditions do not just magically manifest by magical means automatically. That's not how it works, folks. Uh, you know, and that bursts a lot of people's bubble right off the bat. But this is a key concept to understand. So what are these requirements? We need to know certain things. Knowledge is required. Knowledge. Knowledge that will spur us to action. That's what's required. Okay? Since human beings as a species do not already have the things that they say they want, and again, at least not in fullness. If we want to split hairs, we could say we have a, a modicum of what we, say, we may say that we want, but we don't have it in the fullness that we will say that we want it, especially societally, globally. Okay? So since we don't already have these things, it follows logically that the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining these things okay, either must be absent, they are not, the knowledge is not present anywhere, or if it is present, if that knowledge for obtaining those things, the requirements for obtaining those things, if that knowledge is present, then it must be willfully being ignored. It is here and yet people aren't paying attention to it. They aren't taking it in and accepting it and doing anything with that knowledge. So they're ignoring it because it's uncomfortable. As long as this knowledge continues to remain either unknown or ignored, the manifestation of the desired conditions that we say that we want is impossible. Can not happen. It is an impossibility for it to magically, automatically manifest without the requirements being met. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. What are these requirements? What is this knowledge? This knowledge is occulted, meaning hidden. Okay, now, how many people here came here today thinking that they were going to hear information about the occult by a show of hands? Okay, about half the room. Good. Okay, for the rest of the people, that may come as a shock. But what you have to understand right off the bat is that the word occult, it's simply derived from Latin, the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus in Latin means hidden, hidden from sight. And it's derived from the Latin noun oculus, which means eye. Okay, the word ocular in English means related to the eye or related to sight or vision. So what the occult is, is something, it is a body of knowledge that has been hidden away for a specific reason. And we're going to get into what that reason is. Okay, so uh, from the, the term oculus or eye in Latin comes the verb occultare. Occultare means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. To keep hidden from the eye so that it cannot be seen. The information regarding natural law is occulted knowledge. It is knowledge that has been hidden from humanity. Okay? It has been, it's held by the few, which, which is represented here at the top of this pyramid. You can look at this as a pyramid representing knowledge or ignorance. At the top of the pyramid, you have knowledge. It's the, the highest, higher you go in the pyramid, the more knowledge. Okay? But the pyramid tapers because at the top, very few people understand that information. Very few, few people have that knowledge and have actually integrated it into themselves to the, to the point where it becomes understanding. All right? Down here, you have no knowledge, the igno ignorant masses. Okay? And, and up here, you have the people who are in the know, right, who have this knowledge about how natural law works and are actually using it for a certain reason. We're going to get to that next, what that is. So please, as you go through this seminar, please keep in mind, if I ever use the term occult, all I'm talking about here is hidden knowledge. 
That's what it means. Occulted knowledge is hidden. Now, why would anybody want to hide knowledge that is extremely important? Well, there's a very specific reason, all right? But before we even get to that, we have to talk about what is this occulted knowledge? What, what is the body of knowledge? What does it comprise? When, I, when I'm saying the occult, the knowledge of the occult, what do I mean by that? All right? Occult knowledge constitutes two things. There's two general bodies of occult knowledge. In, in, in the actual mystery traditions and in occult schools, they talk about these as arcana, A-R-C-A-N-A, -A -A, arcana. Ar the word arcana is also Latin. It means knowledge, okay? That's all it means. So there's two bodies of knowledge. There's one body of knowledge in the occult called lesser arcana, the lesser arcana or the minor arcana. This means the, the knowledge of the microcosm, the knowledge of the small things, okay? It doesn't mean it's less important. It means it's dealing with the individual units of consciousness, the human psyche, the, the psyche of the individual, okay? So the first part, the first major body of occult knowledge constitutes knowledge of human consciousness, how it works, how it operates, what our motivations are, things like that, okay? The second body of occult knowledge is called the greater arcana or the major arcana. All right, And again, this doesn't refer to that it's more important. It refers to it is the macrocosmic understanding, the understanding of the very large laws of nature that govern the, the, the macrocosm. Okay, So universal laws are part of the greater arcana of occult knowledge. And what I call here today, under the umbrella, the term natural law, falls into that second category of greater knowledge, the greater arcana of occult knowledge, okay? And what these natural laws are, are unseen and universal spiritual laws. We're going to talk, we could talk about the word natural here too. Natural is derived from Egyptian and other Middle Eastern tradition languages, okay? The word netter in, in Egyptian, which would have been spelled without vowels. If we transliterated it, it would be N-T-R in English. Netter means spirit in Egyptian, in ancient Egyptian. The, the, the suffix A-L, even in English today, but if you go back into Arabic languages and uh, you know ancient Middle Eastern languages, um, A-L as a suffix actually means of or related to, or having come from, okay? So natural, if you put these root words together, netter and al, right, it means of or related to the realm of spirit, of or related to God, actually. The word netter also meant God, spirit or God, okay? So this is the spiritual domain, the laws that actually are operating in the unseen realm, okay? Now, they manifest in the physical realm. We're going to talk about that. Okay, because that's the, the operation that it trickles down from. It starts in the spiritual domain, and then it manifests in the physical domain. All right? So it's important to understand these two bodies of knowledge, the lesser arcana, okay, is about the monad or the individuated unit of consciousness of the human being. And then the greater knowledge is about the laws that govern the macrocosmic universe. All right. So, what these laws do, this body of of uh, the workings of nature that I am calling under the umbrella natural law, they're universal spiritual laws which govern the consequences of behavior. They govern the consequences of behavior, and I would add a caveat to that: they govern the consequences of behavior for intelligent species, for beings that are capable of coming to their understanding, okay? I, I, and I would delineate that from, like, the animal kingdom, okay? The animal kingdom is not held to the same standard as, the, as human beings when it comes to this body of information because I don't think you're going to sit down with your cat and explain natural law to it, okay? So when people say, well, why doesn't the animal kingdom 
uh, held to account in the same way the human beings are. It's because, surprise, surprise, we don't share the same level of consciousness. Okay, There is differences in levels of consciousness and abilities to comprehend information and, and uh, to actually know how something works. Just like you will not be explaining physics to your dog anytime soon, Okay, you're not going to explain natural law to the animal kingdom and have them grasp it because they're not at the same level of consciousness as, as we are. Okay, So we are held to a different account when it comes to natural law. It governs human behavior. It would be an easy way of saying it. This body of knowledge has actually been called consequentialism by past researchers and teachers. And I have no problem with that term. I, I, I've actually looked into consequentialism and it's quite similar, okay, in, in its scope and what it teaches. It's been called karma, karmic law in many Middle Eastern and Eastern traditions, okay? And I have no problem with that term for it either. It has been called in some of the Western traditions and Christian traditions moral law, and I have no problem with that term either. Uh, religionists have called it God's law, and I have no problem with that term either. I have no problem with any of these terms being applied to the umbrella of natural law, because that, that is essentially what it is. But we're going to get into deeply into how it works and operates in our lives here today. Why is this knowledge hidden away from people? To what ends? The knowledge of the occult, the hidden in knowledge about how natural law works and how consciousness works, is not commonly known. That's why it's not the exoteric. It's not given to the masses. It's the esoteric. It is reserved for the few. And there's a reason for that. It's been deliberately hidden away and kept from the general public in order to create and maintain a power differential. Because if someone else is an extreme level of knowledge, and they know how something works, like something as trivial as how human consciousness works, how human motivations work, how human perceptions work, how human beings can be manipulated. If somebody has deep knowledge of that information, and there's a whole bunch of people over here who have not one iota of how that works. What kind of a number do you think somebody can do on people like that? See, the way I ask people to look at this is real simple. Imagine a very, very, very advanced psychologist at the top of his field, wrote all the textbooks, okay? And he's got a house out in the Burbs. He comes into the university. to t He's got tenure, okay? He's got the trophy wife, the house out in the suburbs, the three-car garage, driving the Lexus into work at his tenure job. And he finds out that his trophy wife is having an affair because she's bored. She's not satisfied with him at home. And... It's maybe the 19-year-old, uh, uh, you know, uh, captain of the local uh, high school football team or something. He's a senior. He's a star football player, right? The jock, yeah. And she has a fling with him. Well, what if he decides, I'm going to become buddy-buddy with my boy here after finding out about his wife's affair? And this kid, this punk, who's cheating on, my, you know, my wife's cheating on me with, uh, he knows nothing. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't study the mind. He doesn't know anything even about himself. He watches TV six hours a day, plays violent video games, is obsessed with football, you know? What kind of a number you think that psychologist can do on that kid? Total number. That's the answer, exactly. That's right. He could do a total number on him. He can gain his confidence. He can get into his head. And I guarantee you, you give him a little bit of time, he could screw up his life based on what he knows and how he would be able to manipulate based on his hatred of that person. Well, guess what? That's the position humanity's in. We're that punk jock. And I'm not saying we necessarily did something to deserve it, but we're in that same position where the people with this knowledge at the highest levels, they hate us. And they're doing a total number on us because we don't have this knowledge. And until that changes, don't expect the playing field to be leveled. Expect it to get worse, okay? The knowledge is hidden to create and maintain a power differential. 
between those who hold it and those who are ignorant of it. It's that simple. The knowledge of natural law and its operations constitutes what I call the most deeply occulted or hidden information that exists on this planet. You will not find any more hidden information. This is the thing that all the distractions are there for, to keep you from learning. The endless trivialities, the nonsense you hear on the news, all the video games, all the nonsense television, the sports, you know, it's all there to keep people from understanding this. And I can't get you to accept that or believe it, and I don't ask you to believe it. I'm telling you that's what they're trying to, from my years of being inside occult traditions that are very, very dark, I'm telling you this is what they don't want you to know from firsthand experience. How many people here today, today know that I was involved in the dark occult in my past? Good. Great. Okay. The powers that be want to seek to keep this information hidden from the people of the earth at all costs because understanding this information about natural law will level the playing field and put an end to the currently entrenched systems of control that are operating on the earth. We should very clearly make a distinguishment between nescience and ignorance so the people fully understand the difference between these two concepts. How many people even have heard the term nescience? Very few. This is a word that has practically been sanitized from colloquial English. Practically been sanitized from the English lang language. And there's a reason for that too. There's two contexts to not knowing something. The first context is nescience. Okay? Nescience comes from the Latin. The prefix ne in Latin means not or not present or absent. Okay? And then scio, sciere in Latin means to know. It's where we get the word science from. Okay? So, you put them together, and nescience, it, it actually, those two roots form another word, nescire. Nescire in Latin means not to know, to not know, to not understand. But there's a connotation to it. It means to not understand because the specific information that you may be uh, having uh, a desire to understand is completely absent. It is not present, and you cannot actually aggregate that information. You can't bring those pieces of grammar together to form the sentence, okay? It's not present, okay? So you don't have it at all. It's unattainable. This should be clearly delineated from ignorance. Now, nescience is not someone's fault. The information just isn't there, okay? You can't be blamed for nescience. There is no blame in nescience. The person who is nescient is not to be blamed for being nescient. The information simply wasn't present so they could take it in and then come to understand it. Ignorance carries blame. This is another thing people want to think in the New Age movement, there's no such thing as. Nobody's to blame. And that goes to that there's no cause for anything that's happening, as you'll hear a lot in the New Age circles. Okay, I very strongly put down these notions, or attempt to, Okay? There are causes and effects. There are people who are responsible for what is happening. There is blame. Blame exists. Okay? There are, peop there are people who are culpable. We're going to talk about moral culpability later. So ignorance has blame attached to it and responsibility attached to it. Okay? It comes from the Latin verb ignorare in Latin, and this means not to know, just like nescience means not to know, but in a completely different connotation. The connotation of ignorance means you don't know even though necessary information is present and right there before you because you have willfully refused or disregarded that information. Whether you've disre refused it because it made you feel uncomfortable or whether you disregarded it because you felt that's not important for me to know. I don't need to know that. Or you feel you already understand something that contradicts with what's, you know, the new thing that you're hearing or seeing. Okay? So when you willfully disregard something, okay? If I wanted to willfully disregard the gentleman sitting in the front row, he's present. 
I could sit, just pretend he's not here and ignore him. That's what ignoring is. This is why I, I try to say, tell to pe- say to people, the, the impact of the word is almost lost to us of the word ignorance because of the way it's pronounced. I tell people, start pronouncing it ignorance. Ignorance. Then people will hear the word ignore in it. And, and the connotation becomes clear. It means you're ignoring it. Ignorance. Okay? That's how I like to say it now. Because the connotation is clear that way. The, it's, it, the, the information is there. The truth is there. And somebody wants to ignore it completely. Now, that is inexcusable. And there is blame that is attached with that. So what I ask people all the time is, do we have a nescient society or do we have an ignorant one? Do we have an ignorant one? Is our society ensconced in nescience or is it ensconced in ignorance? I would argue absolutely that we are ensconced in ignorance in society, not nescience. I think we are drowning in information. I think we are drowning in the truth that is all around us. But people are ignoring it, largely. Not everyone. There's many people who are very hungry for it and taking it in as fast as they can, you know? But I think the majority of human beings are in the state of ignorance, even though the truth is present all around us. And that constitutes what Art talked about earlier, this consensus trance, which people in the so-called truth community or truth movement have likened to sleep. They say, say that they are asleep. I, I liken it to hypnosis. If you look at the origins of the word hypnosis, right, it means suppressed knowledge. It comes from Greek. Hypo means under, as in hypodermic, under the skin. And gnosis means knowledge, the suppression of knowledge. Hypo means suppression also, under and suppression. So, Hypnosis is the suppression of knowledge. And that's the state that these people are in. And it's, it's done by themselves. It's not, see, we have to stop looking at this as victim, as a victim relationship. This is a willful choice. In a time of overwhelming information available at people's fingertips, the truth being ignored is not an option. It's a willful decision that people are making. And it's a decision that they should be held accountable to because of what is going on that they are ignoring, what they are allowing to go on in their name and not saying a thing about it. Content to let evil run amok. All right? And then people will wonder, why are we losing freedom? Why is freedom on the wane? Why is totalitarianism and tyranny rising up? Why do we see so much control and obsession with control in our society? You know, they'll see that. Many of them will see the rising police state. They'll see the injustices in our society. They'll see the restrictions on our our inherent natural liberty. Okay? But here's the thing. Many of them will not make the transition to grasping. You know? They'll say, yeah, this is what's happening to the earth. It's being turned into a huge prison everywhere. And at the most rapid pace right here in America. Okay? And they'll see this lock going onto the cage. But the question that they never get to, they don't even get to the question, let alone the answer, is why? They'll talk about the symptoms. They'll describe the prison. They'll describe every corner of the cage accurately in many cases. They can tell you exactly how it's working. They can tell you all the different aspects of the control system. But they can't tell you why it's actually going into place. Why is that happening? Well, that's what this presentation answers. Why are we losing freedom? And it gets to the actual heart of that answer. So what this presentation constitutes is a master key that unlocks all the locks to all the doors on all the cages in the prison, if it is accepted. 
And once again, I don't tell you that belief is required for that. Because truth is always present. It's always here. It's a matter of will we perceive it as being present, acknowledge it's present by stop ignoring it, okay, and then accept it into ourselves, and then do something with it. Understanding is not the end. Taking in the knowledge and understanding is the beginning. Action is required. See, knowledge is required. Understanding is required. But then action is finally required. Above all, if change is to be created. And that's how the laws of attraction really work. So, will people as a whole, as a society, accept that master key? I can't answer that question. All I could do is try to place it into their hands. After I have taken that key and unlocked my personal prison, my personal cages, and freed my mind, all I can do is try to help people to see, here's how this key works. Here it is. Here's the information that constitutes that key. And here's how you put it to work in your life. That's all I can do. Can't make anybody take it. Let's look at what problem solving entails, because that's really critical to understand if we're going to get past the, this stage and where we're at in our stifled uh, evolutionary development as a species. There's a few main steps to solving problems, any problem. doesn't matter what the nature of the problem is. The first is you have to recognize that the problem exists. Recognize that there is a problem to begin with. And I think by asking the question, is everybody content with the way things are, and nobody raised their hand, I think that's great because it, it, it at least acknowledges to me the people here today recognize we have a problem. And that's healthy. That's good. Okay? Many people out there don't believe we have a problem. You know, they, they, they like this place. They like the world the way that it is. You know, which is unfathomable to me because to me it's a living hell. And that's not because of how my own personal life is going. I'm very content with my own personal life. I have no self-inflicted suffering in my personal life. I don't create problems for myself. My life goes on very well according to how I live it without hurting anybody else. The problem is other people. And that's another thing new, the New Agers won't acknowledge. And they'll flip out if you say that there's a problem with someone else. There are problems with other people. Okay? And people will say people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. My glass house has been taken down long since, long time ago, because I went through all that personal introspective work, and I dug deep into my subconscious and faced those problems and confronted them head on and healed them and came out of the mindset that I was once in. Okay? So, you know, people will say, if there's something you don't like, you're seeing in, in other people, that's something in yourself that you're seeing in them. This, this is new age mumbo jumbo nonsense. Okay? If you're not part of the problem, I'm not part of this problem. I can say that honestly. I'm not part of this problem. I can look at every single person, anybody who's watching this, and say, I'm not part of the problem that's happening on the earth. With all honesty and knowing that I am telling the truth with that. Okay? But, but see, at one point, I was part of the problem. And a, a big part of the problem. Okay? What I had to do at some point is stop doing this and pointing out and saying the problem lies elsewhere while I was still part of it. And then I had to do this and point squarely at myself and say, what do I need to change here, here, and finally, here, in the guts, in the courage. You know, people will say, yeah, change happens in the mind. It happens in the heart. But lastly, it happens in the guts. We need to generate what I call the heart, mind, guts. Okay? You got to care enough to know and then put it into action. The heart, mind, guts. Okay? That taking action is the most important step when it comes to creating change. And we're going to get to that in a moment. But the whole point here is, I had to look at what I needed to change about myself in my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions, and then change those things in myself. This is what most people want to run away from. 
They want to say, yeah, I want those things that I say I want to magically to be present in my life, but I don't want to do those things that require self-change in how I think, in how I feel, and in how I act. I want it magically to happen without changing those things in me. So I can honestly look at the rest of the world and say, the problem does not lie within me. I am not seeing a manifestation of myself in other people. Other people have not done the same process that I have, the introspective work that I have, and gone through that painful, painstaking work that involves effort, hard effort. I'm not up here telling people, I'm offering you the the tonic. You're going to take a sip and magically you will be enlightened. Okay? Knowing what's going on in the world is hard work. It involves destruction. It's a destructive process. It involves destruction of belief systems. It involves completely breaking down barriers that are in your head. Okay? Hardly anybody wants to do that work. People want to run a million miles an hour in the opposite direction from that work. Anything but that. I'll take the grave instead of that. Okay? That's where most people's heads are at. All right? So let's get back to the steps here for problem solving. The first is you got to recognize that there's a problem. If you are in denial, good luck. Let me know how that works out for you. Because you're not solving any problem in a state of denial at all. Fear-based denial of the problem must first be dealt with and conquered and stamped out. And you have to acknowledge how bad it is. You know? People feel symptoms coming on of a disease or something and they want to ignore it because they don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I'm sick. I don't want to believe I have a problem. Then you're waiting, waiting, waiting. You don't get it diagnosed and then it turns into a much bigger problem, which is where we're at as a society for ignoring this information. This is what denial looks like, symbolically. Okay, A person with their head in the sand like an ostrich. And please take note, ladies and gentlemen, when you're in this position, When you're in the position of denial with your head in the sand, you're on your knees with your ass in the air. Okay? I almost say it's amazingly synchronistic that the human body was designed like that. That in order to put your head in the sand, symbolically, so to speak, you have to be on your knees. Okay? And that's where most of our society is at. They're on their knees. And in that state of denial. The second step to problem solving is to recognize that the symptoms that are being displayed, the symptoms you are seeing, are merely effects of underlying causal factors. You can't treat symptoms and solve a problem. It's not possible. That's not how problem solving works. You have to get to what caused the problem. Okay? Instead of simply treating symptoms, make an accurate diagnosis of the causes of the problem. So what does the word diagnosis mean? Diagnosis comes from Greek. The preposition dia, transliterated there, there in the parentheses, you see it in, in Greek script, okay? It means through or by way of. So by a method, by a particular method, all right? And the second part of diagnosis is the Greek noun gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge in Greek. So what a diagnosis means is through knowledge or by way of knowledge. You're going to solve the problem by way of knowledge. There is knowledge that acts as the requirement to solving the problem and getting what you want. And here's another thing, and I'm going to keep going back to this. It's going to be like an undercurrent in this. Because the New Age community, and I'm going to be, I'm, have been, but I'm going to become a more outspoken opponent of New Age ideologies because they are lying to people, whether it be through direct, willful deception or whether it be through useful dupes and useful idiots. They are telling people things that are completely inaccurate to how things really work, all right? Because they want to keep people suppressed and non-active. They want people in acceptance mode of everything. Accept, 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 never rebel, okay? Don't take action, just observe, just watch. You'll hear all these things in the New Age movement, okay? 
The reason I bring it up is because when you even say the word knowledge to some New Agers, they almost take offense. Because what's, what the New Age is becoming is the new modern day variant. It's a new form of what's known as solipsism. And we're going to get to what solipsism is in a little while. Okay? But essentially, people don't want to hear that knowledge is what is required. Because the attainment of real knowledge, not pseudo-knowledge, real knowledge, requires work. It requires effort. It requires reading. It requires listening. It requires watching. And you know what most of all it requires that people don't want to give up? Who can tell me? Time. Thank you, sir. It requires time. There's one of the currencies people don't spend, uh, you know, on many things that they don't feel they can get immediate gratification from, which is why immediate gratification is so stressed in our society by the control system. That's what keeps people in their ignorance. So a diagnosis means if you're going to get well, you've got to have the knowledge of the underlying causal factors that, that led to the creation of the symptoms. You're not going to treat the symptoms and get well. You got to have the knowledge to get to the causal factors to find out what cause put this into effect. And we're going to talk a lot about cause and effect. The third step to problem solving is through the knowledge that you've acquired now via making an accurate diagnosis of the problem of the causal factors, right? You're going to then put that knowledge into action. Understanding what created the problem is like step two, right? Stop being in denial. Understand what caused the problem. Act on the knowledge you now have to solve the problem, to make it right, okay? So action is required. We make the diagnosis, then we have to take the required action necessary to rectify or to set right, which is what the word rectify means, the causal factors that led to the manifestation, of the problem. Let's talk a little bit about the concept of what truth is, how I refer to truth in all of my work. Because people have a real deeply mystified concept of what truth is or what it means. You know, they'll get into all these really deep abstract discussions of uh, the mind of God and, you know, uh, trying to get into like, you know, quantum theory and everything. Th this is mystification of the concept of the truth. And we have to demystify it. We have to bring it down to real simple, easy to understand language that anybody can comprehend. And then really completely delineate that from perception of any given thing. Because the two are not the same. When people say perception is reality, nothing could be farther from reality than that statement. Perception is not reality, okay? It is just what it says, perception. Seeing through, perceive, to see through something, like a lens or a filter, okay? I perceive things differently without these glasses. That's one perception. When I put them on, I perceive things quite differently and more clearly, okay? Well, that's how human perception works, like a lens. It's a filter, okay? But what's there is the same thing. What's there is the same thing. All the change is how I perceived it. All right? So let's look at this concept. Truth is objective. That means that it's not dependent upon the perceptions of human beings. No one wants to hear that. That is, that is a direct assault, a direct frontal assault on the human ego. Because everybody wants to hear, my perceptions are important. And we want to also believe my perceptions are accurate. Okay? Now people will say, well, what makes you say your perception of this topic is going to be accurate? That's because I went through the process of having to admit over and over and over and over and over again endlessly how wrong I was about my former perceptions. I went through that destructive process of breaking down my former belief systems, of breaking down my former emotional patterns, of, uh, and of, of most of all, changing my behavior. 
That's the thing that's the most destructive because we get attached to our behaviors and patterns. So asking people to change, I recognize it's not easy. It took me like probably, probably about eight years of my life to do it. Most people don't want to spend a minute on creating personal change, let alone eight years. And, you know, when I look at myself, in all honesty, again, none of this is to sound egoic or to toot my own horn, but I look at it like I was a mild case of ego entrapment, a mild case compared to where I see other people at. I, I, I feel like I was the, uh, uh, you know, a very brittle stone that just needed to be hit with a chisel a few times and it broke into powder. You know, other people are hardened granite or diamond. You know, to break them down is going to take enormous effort and work. And most of them don't even want to do it. They're so calcified, you know. They're so, the, the, they've been so compressed into that hardened state that they don't even want to start. So I realize telling people your perceptions are not what really matters, you know. That the truth isn't based upon how you perceive things, that it's independent from your perceptions. Most people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. Human beings' perceptions are capable of wavering. They can, they can waver slightly from the truth, and they can waver wildly from the truth. All right? What truth is, is that which does not waver. It doesn't move. It's that which is. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about it. It doesn't matter whether anybody believes it. It doesn't matter whether anybody knows it. It doesn't matter whether anybody sees it. It doesn't matter whether anybody wants to see it. It's there. It's always been there. It's always going to be there. Nothing anybody does can change what has happened. Can anybody change what has already occurred in what we call in, in the thinking of linear time, the past? Not one person here is capable of doing that. Let me tell you something. Not one being in the entire manifested universe is capable of doing that. Because that which has already occurred is set in the record of the universe. Nothing can change the past. Ever. Great movie on this. Watch the new movie, The Time Machine. Not the original 50s version or 60s version. The new one. I think it came out in late 90s or early 2000s. Okay? This movie got crushed in reviews. Crushed. Whenever reviewers crush a movie and give it the worst ratings, go see that film. Because <laughs> I guarantee you, there's very important allegorical concepts that you need to understand embedded in that film, and that's why the reviewers crush it, because they don't want you getting any ideas. You know? This movie got crushed in the theaters, and I'm telling you, it's one of the best films to understand the concept of the absolute impossibility of changing the past. The past cannot be altered. You know what can be altered? The future. That's what that movie's about. And you know where the alteration of the future begins? In the present moment. That's exactly right. That's the only place it begins. Okay? So what truth is, the demystified concept of truth, is it's simply that which already exists. It's that which has happened in the past and is happening in the present moment. The truth does not exist in the future. When we get to those future moments and it's the present, truth will be existent then, but not until, okay? So there is no such thing as truth in the future. Truth is that which has occurred in the past and that which is occurring in the present. It is simply that which is and that which has been. Please recognize, when I use the word truth, that is all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the mind of God. I'm not talking about the entire reason for the existence of the universe. I'm talking about the events that have taken place in the past and are taking place in the present. That's all. And guess what? That's all the truth is. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Okay? You want to make it more complicated than that, call it something other than truth so as not to confuse people to what truth really is. Truth versus human perception, okay? Now, I want to ask people to imagine, see these white lines? Imagine these white lines that do not waver as truth. And imagine that the perception 
that is set against the truth, we're going to take three different individuals. This is individual A, this is individual B, this is individual C. Okay? Their ability to perceive what has occurred and what is occurring is what I would refer to as consciousness. Okay? Consciousness is a being's ability to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to those patterns. Meaning you have an accurate understanding of what's taking place within and around you, or you have an inaccurate understanding of what's taking place in and around you. If your consciousness is high, meaning it's at a high frequency, okay, that means you're going to have more of an ability to understand and recognize the patterns. If your consciousness is low, you're at a low frequency, you're going to see the pattern less. You're not going to accurately perceive. So I liken this to a wave form. In simple, you know, physics, a wave, this is a simple sine wave, okay? It has its crest here and its trough here, okay? And then the pattern repeats, goes up to the crest, down to the trough, and, and, and it repeats over again. The distance between the uh, either crests or troughs of the wave is called the wavelength, okay? The longer the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. What that means is how frequently is it going to be intercepting the line that represents truth? How frequently is it going to be aligned with this line, which we are calling truth? Okay. Now, can everybody just, with that love, with that explanation, Understand this simple model and what I'm talking about here. Is that clear? Okay, because it's important. Because this is a low frequency vibration. It's a low frequency wave. A wave like this, if it was an audio wave, would produce a low frequency. It would produce a low bass tone. Okay? As we go up to a higher frequency, you can see the wavelength is shorter, meaning that it intercepts the line which represents truth much more frequently. We can count them. One, two, three, four, five here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine there. Okay? So this is a higher frequency vibration. And we go up to an even higher frequency. Let's say person C has this consciousness. They have a higher frequency. Okay? and they're intercepting the, the uh, line that represents truth much more frequency. I won't count those out because there's a lot of them, okay? The higher the frequency, the more in tune with truth we are. What would happen if this frequency became infinitely high? What would it become? It would be indistinguishable from a line. And therefore, someone would be aligned to that which is. The higher the level of consciousness or frequency, which is their perception of reality being accurate, okay? Not wavering as much from the truth because it's hitting it in more places. We would, we would basically, this wave would turn into a line at some point, the higher the frequency went. Think about this in sound, right? You hear a low bass tone, it's like, then it goes up, and it would go eventually outside the range of human hearing because the frequency went so high. Same concept here. The higher the, the, the higher the, um, frequency, the higher the perception of reality, the quality of the perception is going to be. Okay? The concept to keep in mind here is perception is not reality. It's the filter we see reality through. What the human being's work is to do is to align their perception to the reality which exists, which is truth. We need to set aside what we want the truth to be and look at what it is. What it is is altogether different than what we want it to be. But until we recognize what it is, we're, we're not even in a position to make an accurate diagnosis of what's going on and therefore create what we want it to be. So I'm going to give the first quote here. It comes from a gentleman I, I personally greatly respect. How many people are familiar with Travis Walton by a show of hands? Hardly anybody in the room. Wow, two people. Amazing. And I know Barb is in the back because we've met him personally. I spoke with this gentleman at a conference last year in 2012. And I just want to say, I just think he's a totally genuine individual. I don't care what anybody thinks of me saying that. Okay? I believe him. Do I know factually that what he claims happened to him did? No, I do not. But I believe what he is saying for a reason. 
when I am around somebody, especially for any length of time, I think I can, my intuition is good that I can get a feel for their heart, okay? And when he's telling you stuff, it's very consistent. And in his book, he asked people, you need to listen to my whole story, suspend your disbelief for a minute, and then do your research and then make a judgment call. Do you want to believe me? Do you think I'm telling you the truth? Do you think I'm lying to you? And then make up your own mind, okay? And what Tra who Travis Walton is, he was uh, claims that he was an abductee, that he was taken uh, on board uh, an extraterrestrial craft at a, a point in his life. He disappeared for days. They were out looking for him, and his best friends were accused of murdering him. And he shows up five days later in, like, deplorable conditions, uh, you know, out on a country road someplace. Um, but anyway, again, I spoke with him back in 2012. I just bumped into him again. We were just at a conference. I'm bringing this up for a reason. We were just at a conference in Philadelphia where he spoke. And uh, this quote, I feel I, I would start, if I was going to quote somebody, I was going to make this like the first quote in the presentation today. Travis Walton says in his, in his book, which is called Fire in the Sky, he said, I have come to realize that the biggest problem anywhere in the world, the biggest problem anywhere in the world is that people's perceptions of reality are compulsively filtered through the screening mesh of what they want and do not want to be true. Now, when I read that in his book, I got chills up and down my spine. Because I said, this meshes exactly with what I'm talking about in my section, in my presentation called Truth Versus Perception. And he's encapsulating it in a sentence perfectly. All right? We want things to be true. That doesn't make it so. That's not what makes truth the way that it is. What makes truth is the way that it is, is what behaviors were taken and what is the actual effect in the manifested world. That's how things are, okay? It doesn't matter how we want them to be. They may be a completely different way right now than we want them to be, and I would say for the people in this room, they are a completely different way than we want them to be. But most people in the world think, they, they kind of believe that they're the arbiter of truth. And that's a bad place to be in. That's a very, very low level of consciousness. To think that if I don't believe that it's this way, it's not this way. Many people are trapped in that state of mind, okay? Now, the reason I even bring this up and included uh, Travis's quote here is at this conference that we were just at a couple of weeks ago, okay, I didn't speak at it, I tabled at it. Um, a woman came up to my table and she picked up my New Age Bullshit DVD, which is available here today in the back. And she said, what's this about? with a real skeptical look. And I, said, I explained, I said, well, it's a seven-hour extended pod, po video podcast that uh, has many, many slides, okay? I, I gave a shortened version of it at the Free Your Mind conference in Philadelphia. And this is the extended version that goes deeply into the deception of the New Age movement and how it is a religion that is designed to suppress the masculine side of the personality, which is the side that actually takes action and creates change, okay? And that's, of course, pushed by the sacred feminine, which is care and creativity, or and compassion, right? Both need to be present. We're going to talk about that here today. But I said, this is about the suppression of that masculine energy, and that's what the New Age movement is about, the suppression of the masculine, right? So... I said, what the New Age religion wants to teach people is just accept everything the way it is, no matter how unjust it is, no matter how deplorable the conditions are, no matter how much evil, evil is taking place in our midst, accept it. That's the New Age religion. And here's what she said. Here's what she said. That's exactly how I am. I just accept everything. I don't make any judgments on anything that occurs, no matter what it is, no matter how it's perceived. You want to perceive it as evil? That's your judgment. I said, yes, it is my judgment. You know why? Because it's evil. It really is. There is such a thing. 
I said, and you're content to let evil run amok and take this whole world because you don't want to act. Because what's really there is cowardice. That's what it really is. Okay? And she didn't want to hear that. She said, I prefer not to see it that way. Now, align this with the quote. I prefer not to see it that way. Okay? And I hope by some miracle she happens to see this presentation at some point. Okay? And, you know, in hindsight, I didn't say this to her on the spot, but I thought about it for a little bit the next day. And what I should have really said is, no, you prefer not to see, period. That's the truth. Okay? So, I prefer not to see it that way means, no, I want to ignore reality. I, I want to believe what I want to be true is the way that it already is. And this is what the New Age hoax is peddling to people. Okay? So, great quote that I thought accurately sums it all up. See, she, this woman also told me that she is a follower, quote unquote, of the uh, New Age ideology that is referred to as the Course in Miracles. How many people have even heard of this? A lot of people. Okay? You know what that is? It's called solipsism, wrapped in a nice, neat new package. Solipsism. How many people are familiar with the ideology called solipsism? Good. More than I would have thought. Most people have never heard of this. Okay? Solipsism is a completely egoic and destructive ideology that has absolutely no bearing or resemblance to truth in any way. And the people who are solipsists are mentally ill. I'm not even going to provide any evidence of that. I'm telling you, you need to research this religion and sickness for yourself. It's a mental illness. A solipsist is a mentally ill person who should probably be somehow removed, segregated from society, and institutionalized until they are made well, because they are a destructive influence on society. This is what I focused on on podcast number one of my podcast series and radio shows. I went into the ideology of what solipsism is and how destructive it is and how it's a religion, okay? What this is, well, first of all, let's look at the word. And you'll, you'll notice I'll be breaking down words all day long because if you don't understand where words came from, you don't really understand what they really were intended to mean. Regardless of whatever connotation they may have taken on in the modern world, the intended meaning of the word, the original meaning, is derived from its etymological derivation. You need to go into the ancient languages, Latin and Greek roots and other languages, Germanic, Arabic, etc., and you need to break down the words from their etymological origins. Then you will understand their real meaning. And I'm telling you, you do this, and the top of your head will blow off by what you will find, by what words we speak on a daily basis actually mean, and we have no idea what they mean. Okay, so the word solipsism comes from the Latin adjective solus, which means alone or one. And then the Latin pronoun ipse, which means self, myself, etc. Okay, the ideology of solipsism is that nothing exists outside of me. I'm the only being that exists in creation. Or essentially, it's another way of saying I'm God. Okay, that my perception is the only real perception, and no one else is here. Now imagine that. Now, what I'm, tell what I'm actually essentially telling the audience here today is your perceptions are not the truth. You have to work to align your perceptions with the truth. That's damaging enough to the human ego, okay? If I just said, none of you exist, I'm only perceiving your existence, I'm the only one who exists, imagine how egoic that statement is, and actually how demoralizing it is to other people. You're even telling them, I don't even consider that you exist. That's what a solipsist is. They believe the universe is a big illusion created for somehow for their amusement. And that there's no objective reality that you don't exist, you don't exist, you don't exist, you don't exist. I'm the only one who exists. And that's not mental illness. We don't diagnose that as mental illness. Okay? I, I don't care if you want to accept the notion everything is one. I personally accept that notion. I do accept that we are all one. That doesn't mean you're not existent in the physical domain right now as I'm talking to you. Of course we all exist here 
We are in the physical domain, okay? The whole point is, these people want to believe the entire spiritual do uh, physical domain is such an illusion that nothing that takes place in it matters or has any significance and should just be watched and nothing should be done to change it. And you know, let me explain what this is, folks. When I was a Satanist, okay, and I was working inside the Church of Satan and other dark occult organizations, they have, a, they have a set of sins, believe it or not. They don't look at them as sins in the same way that, like, you know, religionists look at sin. But they have the things that, these are behaviors and thought patterns that should not be engaged in by the dark occultist themselves, by the magician, if you will. You are not to engage in these behaviors, but we are to peddle them to other people. We are to get them to engage in these behaviors. Okay? You know what the first one is? No, it's not. That's the, that's the second or third. I think it's the third, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the list handy. But the first one is stupidity. That's the first satanic sin. Okay? For the dark occultist. But they want other people in deep stupidity. They want other people in deep ignorance. The idea here is we will know it all. We will know the truth so that we can control others and keep them a dumbed-down herd. Okay? There's a bunch of other ones, but I think the second or third is solipsism. Solipsism is one of the biggest sin for, for Satanists and dark Luciferians. And dark occultists. They don't want any, they don't want any of their membership believing in this mental illness nonsense. Okay? But they want to pr propagate it and peddle it. They want to do that. And they, they told me personally, higher ups in this network told me personally when I was working with them, wait until you see the new age books that we, our membership, will be writing, or either writing ourselves or putting into the hands of useful dupes to write and put out there. We'll be giving them the idea, they'll write it for us, put it out there as their own idea. And they said, we are going to propagate and peddle solipsism like you have never seen. And you know what? When they say something, they do it. I'm serious. They're aligned, their act is together, they act on the same page, and for that I have respect for them as an enemy. And I don't take anything they do lightly. I recognize they have the will. They're not like the rest of, of humanity. They, they, they align their thoughts, their knowledge, with their version of care, you know. It's not like our emotionally based care, but they care about what they're doing, and then they act. And when they act, they act in concert. And they get it done. Okay? I'm not saying, you know, I agree with any of their agenda. Because I don't, and I'm trying to stop it. But I have respect for their unity. They are unified and on the same page, and humanity is not. And that's why, in all honesty, we're having our rear ends handed to us in this spiritual battle right now. At least right now. Solipsism is the ideology that only one's mind is sure to exist. Solipsists contend that knowledge of anything that is outside of one's own mind is unsure, and hence there is no such thing as objective truth. Okay? No such thing as objective truth. And therefore, nothing about the external world and its workings can actually ever be known. Just think about that statement. It's saying... No one can ever know anything. You cannot come to know anything at all. There is no such thing as knowledge. So what I would say to somebody who's following the quote-unquote course in miracles, or a course in solipsism, or a course in acceptance of all forms of evil in this world, is you can't know anything by reading the course in miracles because nothing can be known. You know? How could a solid, why would a solipsist ever pick up a book? Why would a solipsist ever watch anything, any video? Why would a solipsist ever engage in a conversation with another human being? You know? 
Tell the solipsist you can't know that you're going to fall off that cliff, so why don't you go try to walk over and see what happens? Because you can't be sure of anything. They won't do that, though. You know? The whole point here is this is a religion. This is a New Age religion. And I'm telling you who it's peddled by. It's peddled by the occultists who have the knowledge of how natural law works and are trying to put out whatever ideologies they can, destructive ideologies they can, to get people not to understand it. Or to even go so far as to believe that nothing can be understood. Why would you bother to look into natural law? Nothing can be known. It's unbelievable that anybody would be so gullible and naive to fall into this mindset. Let me just tell you what it really is. It's a person who has given up on life. They feel that it's so difficult to know anything and they don't want to do the work to come to that level of knowledge that they've just said, I don't believe it can be known. That makes me feel more comfortable in my ignorance and laziness. That's the, re that's the truth about what solipsism is. Okay, And that's the truth about my friend I bumped into at the, at the MUFON conference. And I'd say that to her face. Okay, So you, we have to realize we're, we're battling this force. This, and this, this religion is on the rise. Solipsism is on the rise. More people are becoming solipsists or solipsistic in their beliefs, in their, in their thought processes. Let's look at some basic definitions and working definitions. <clears throat> now, first thing we're going to define is definition. Let's define what a definition is, okay? A definition is an exact statement, a statement of the exact meaning of a word, all right? We're looking for an exact meaning, not a connotation, not a maybe or a like or a somewhat. We're looking to narrow the focus. That's why it definites it. It makes it finite. We're taking it, not infinite, we're finiting it, we're making it finite, okay? We're, we're, we're actually limiting, through words, what something means so we can be clearer about what we're saying, okay? It's an exact statement or description of the nature, scope, or meaning of something. Another way we could look at a definition when we're talking about visual or audio, audio definition is it's the de degree of distinctness or clarity of an object, image, or sound, okay? So why do people buy HD TV sets? They want higher definition. They want a higher clarity of the picture, okay? If you have high definition audio, for audio files, they won't accept anything but high definition audio because in comparison to low def audio, the clarity of the sound is very good. It's much better. Okay. So that's what definition is. It is all related to clarity. When we use it in conjunction with words, it means the clarity of the meaning is amplified. Okay. And when it's with a picture, the clarity of our vision of the ability to see what the picture is, what the information in the picture is amplified. And same thing with sound. The more accurate the definitions that we have for words or concepts, the better our clarity of meaning and therefore our understanding of those concepts, words or concepts will be. So definition simply means clarity of meaning when we're applying it to words and concepts. So therefore, let's define natural law. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. We have to define it. <clears throat> the simple definition of natural is inherent, having a basis in nature, reality, and truth, not made or caused by humankind. So if it's natural, it wasn't made by man. Mankind didn't make it. Okay? And again, the origin of the word, neter in Egyptian, means spirit, and all means of or related to. So of or related to spirit, it is all of nature, the spiritual domain. See, this is the other part. People believe that the spiritual domain is separate from the physical domain. This is a huge thread and a huge central focus in all of my work. If you think the spiritual domain is not where you are at now because you're in the physical domain, you're mistaken. If you think that the spiritual domain is someplace other than the physical domain, you're also mistaken. If you place emphasis on one above the other, 
and say, well, this one takes precedence and this one's not important. Either way you do it, whether you say the spiritual is more important and the world of matter should not be given any significance, it's imbalanced and it's not true. Okay? Or if you say, hey, like scientism does in many, you know, left brain scientism, the, the material world is all that there is. This is just a dead mechanized clockwork called the universe and it happened by accident for no reason. You know, and this, there's no such thing as the spirit, you know, spiritual domain. Both of these worldviews, and we're going to get to a breakdown of these worldviews, they're completely inter- inaccurate, they're not based in truth, and most of all, they're based on brain imbalance. And we're going to see how one of these worldviews or another develops when either the left brain hemisphere or the right brain hemisphere has taken precedence and dominance within the individual consciousness. So natural means spiritual. The, these words could be used interchangeably. So when I'm talking about natural law, I mean spiritual law, unseen spiritual laws. But overall, the dictionary definition of natural is it's inherent to nature and it's not made by man. The word law is, the definition is, an existing condition which is both binding and immutable. So let's look at each one of these words. Existing. It means that it is present. It is present. Okay? It cannot be just ignored and expected that, oh, well, that doesn't make it true and it's, it's not going to have an effect. It's there. It's present. That's why it's a law that it's in operation, that is in operation. It is binding. Binding means it has an effect. It means it doesn't matter whether you believe that it has an effect. It doesn't matter whether you understand that it has an effect. It doesn't care. And this is another big hammer to the ego. The human ego wants to hear what it wants to hear. One of the things it wants to hear is, the universe cares about you, personally. It cares about John. It cares about Bob. It cares about Mary. It cares about Elizabeth, whatever. Okay, it cares about you individually as a being. Now, you could go so far as to say you believe that the creator of the universe cares about you. I'm not, I'm not denying anybody or saying don't th- think that. What I'm saying is that the laws of the universe don't care about you. Laws have been created in this realm that work flawlessly, 100% of the time, flawlessly. Let me, let me ask people to envision this scenario to try to clarify this. A couple are on a picnic. They're out in a state forest or something like that. They're on a picnic. About 50 yards away from where they're at, okay, there's a pretty tall cliff, maybe about 200 feet. Okay, and it ends in some jagged rocks. They brought their two-year-old child on the picnic with them. They un- unfold the blanket, take out the picnic basket. They're having their picnic. Maybe uh, passions got heated and the husband and wife were you know, making out a little bit. Their, their kid, two-year-old daughter in her nice Sunday sundress or whatever, wanders off, gets to the edge of that cliff. Will gravity care if that girl goes over the edge? No. Will gravity allow her to go over the edge? That, yes, it will. Gravity is not going to say, this girl doesn't understand this law, and she'll die if she goes over that edge. She's innocent. She's nescient, even. Not even ignorant. Innocent and nescient. Will that law still have an effect? You damn better well believe it will. And so does natural law in the same way. It doesn't care whether you don't know. It doesn't care whether you're nescient or ignorant. It's in effect. It's binding. And it is immutable. Immutable means that nothing you can ever do can ever change it. It is in effect eternally. Because man didn't put it into effect. You know who put it into effect? The creator of the universe put it into effect. And I don't really care what you think of that force as. You could think of it as an impersonal force. You could think of it as the man with the beard. You could think of it as this remote control. I don't really care what you think of it as. Personally, that's none of my business. But you know what? If you think of it that it's man that makes the laws, then I have a problem. Because man doesn't make these laws I'm talking about. The creator of the universe set these laws into motion. Put them into effect, and they bind you. You and I are bound by these laws, whether we like it or not, 
whether we accept it or not, whether we understand it or not, they're in effect, and you are already creating the reality that we are experiencing based upon interaction with these unseen laws. Already. You're already doing it. You can never not be doing it. That's an impossibility. Okay? You're always creating, co-creating in harmony, I'm sorry, in cooperation, I should say, whether it's in harmony or opposition is a different story, in cooperation with these spiritual laws that I'm going to talk about. You are already creating in cooperation with them and can never not do so as long as you exist in the physical domain. Okay? So that's what the simple definitions that we're working forward with. Natural law doesn't mean anything other than this. That's it. It means, so let's put them together. Inherent, existing conditions. Conditions that exist in nature which are both binding and immutable. They have an effect whether they're understood or not, and they cannot be changed. So what would be our requirement of knowledge here? What do you think should be done? If we are always working with these, do you think we're going to create something that is wise to create, that is good, that is in alignment with what we say we want if we don't know how these laws operate? You know what's going to be created? A mess. Total chaos. Something you don't want. Something that leads to enormous suffering. Which is where we're at. If, on the other hand, you have that knowledge of how these things work, then you align your behavior to them, you're going to create a whole new different ball game. And then you're going to not have self-inflicted suffering. Okay? That's what this is all about. So, let's give a working definition. This is what I call the sound bite. Right? People say, well, tell me what natural law is, Mark. Uh, you have a few days? Maybe a, a, a large portion of the day like we're going to cover today. Maybe. Some people will get it. Okay? But uh, really, you need to devote a large amount of time to, to studying this, understanding it, reading about it, and even experimenting with it. These are, this is not an untestable hypothesis. Okay, and it's not a hypothesis, it's actually a law. But it's not untestable. You can test it. You can apply all the scientific methodologies to natural law. Same thing. Gather your information, observe, hypothesize, hypothesize, observe, test the results, publish the results. That's the scientific methodology. The scientific methodology will be borne out for everything I'm talking about in this presentation if it is applied. Because this is not a religion. This is not some new age mumbo jumbo. This is a science. It is a science that constitutes knowledge of how laws that are existent, in operation, and immutable in this universe work. And how we are creating what we experience in conjunction with these op operating laws. And man didn't put them into effect. Whatever created this universe put them into effect. I'm not here today to tell you what that is. Your, your job in, in your own personal experience is to get in touch with what you feel that is. I'm not here to tell you what that is. Now, I'm not here to tell anybody what that is. But my whole point is, it created these laws, and they're in effect. And if you want to stop suffering, and if you want the human condition to change, you have to understand how these laws work. There is no way around that. Knowledge of these laws is required. And this is what people in the so-called New Age movement and in religious communities and in other communities don't want to acknowledge. They don't want to acknowledge that work is required. So let's give a working definition for natural law, my soundbite variant, okay? I tell people who want the 6 o'clock news edition of what natural law is, okay? Natural law is universal, non-man-made, binding and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of behavior, and specifically, at least on this planet, human behavior. I would say in the universe, it governs the behavior of all intelligent beings. Intelligent beings. Okay? Natural law is a body of universal spiritual laws which act as the governing dynamics of consciousness. 
the governing dynamics of consciousness. That's the working definition. Let's look at the dynamics between discovery and belief, the difference between discovery and belief, because again, natural law is capable of being discovered, understood, and harmonized with. Now, does that sound like a religion? Religion asks people to believe, accept, and do without question. What this is, is saying, this exists, you're bound by it, the best you can do is to understand its operation like you would understand gravity and therefore not just walk toward the edge of a 200 foot cliff that is bottomed, bottomed by jagged rocks. If you're intelligent and you understand how the law of gravity works, you won't do that behavior. Okay? Just like if you're intelligent and you understand how natural law works, you won't do certain behaviors to create a prison for the entire species, for your entire species. Unfortunately, humanity has not reached that level of consciousness yet. They are not at that level of co-creative intelligence to understand how these laws work and then align their behaviors to them. So natural law has nothing to do with religion. It's not a belief system. It's a science. It is a discoverable operation that is already in effect that we can either understand and align our behavior to or remain ignorant of and suffer as a result of that ignorance because it's already in effect and already has, an, is, has a binding effect upon you and your behaviors and everyone's. So when it comes to belief, and anybody that was trying to propagate a religion wouldn't put this slide up here, when it comes to natural law, it, is, it works just like gravity. So the clown that's going to jump over the cliff saying, I don't believe in gravity, what's going to happen? Down he goes. Because belief is irrelevant. Because natural law does not care about you. It does not care about you. It is in effect, no matter what you do, deal with it. And people don't want to hear that. And I recognize this. I, I recognize I'm not telling anybody anything they want to hear. If, if I wanted to sell a lot of stuff, if I wanted to be real popular, I'd come up here and I'd tell you exactly what you want to hear and then I'd be making $50,000 a presentation like Wayne Dyer does. Okay? And that is his fee. I, I know because I've actually had some people speak to his management. That's what, that's what a new age presenter gets. You know what I ask for? Zero. I don't even ask for a stipend. Because I don't want, I don't even care about fake money. I care about making real money. Real one eye. The word money is actually one eye. And people don't even, have said it a billion times in their life and never recognize what they're saying is one eye. And it's the symbol of the one eye which represents spiritual enlightenment is plastered all over the one dollar bill. Okay? Well, this is the one. See, I tell people, I'm a poor man when it comes to the fake money, but I'm very rich in the real stuff. The real thing, I have tons of. The fake stuff, I don't do so well with, and I don't care. It's not what I'm concerned about. I know it's fake. Okay? So, I don't ask for a stipend when I present. I, I tell whoever's setting up the presentation, pay for my travel and lodging. Hook me up with a dinner or whatever. That's it. I'll come out and speak anywhere. Okay? The point is, if I was trying to appeal to somebody's ego and what they wanted to hear, I would tell you your beliefs are very important. Your beliefs shape. And they, they do shape your reality. In a negative way, if you don't align yourself with truth and you want to stay attached to a belief system because you prefer it over what's real. Okay? So... When it comes to natural law, I'm not telling people don't believe in yourself. See, people will say, there's forms of belief that are good. Yeah, I acknowledge that. I understand that. Believe in yourself. Believe in your own ability to, to, to come to this understanding of, of information like this. But I'm explaining, when it comes to a law that is existent in the universe, your belief doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The universe doesn't care what those, the, that, those parents at that picnic whose child just went over the cliff believed doesn't care whether that girl doesn't know what, how gravity works. 
It's going to have an effect. You act a certain way, like a computer. Boom, you put this in, here's how you program this, that's what has to come out, invariably. Invariably, it is nothing personal. Natural law is not a personal force. It is an impersonal force that every single mystery tradition and occult tradition that has actually wanted to share this knowledge with people has been telling people about and attempting to tell people about since time immemorial. It is an impersonal force. It does not care about you. It does not worry or care in the slightest bit whether you understand it or accept it or not. It is an effect. You are bound by it. the end and stop crying in your milk over it. That's it. No one wants to hear that. And I'm not so naive that I recognize people don't want to hear that, that I don't recognize that. I do recognize that. Believe me, I realize the wall I am up against in saying this. I get it fully, fully. If I wanted to blow smoke up people's rear ends, I'd come up here and I'd say, the universe cares about you and what you believe. And it's going to gauge that, it's going to, it's going to look at all that, and it's going to tabulate it, and it's going to say, well, what did he believe when he took this action? It doesn't, it's not going to say that. It's going to say, is this what happened? Yes or no? Yes? Here's the result. That's it. Unwaveringly and invariably. The human ego has a hard time with that. There was a, some popular TV show, I don't even remember what it was, uh, Barb had downloaded it, and she was watching an episode, and it said, humanity's greatest fear is that truth is absolute. And I, I, I usually don't bother watching any television, okay? I, I, I have downloaded, I download a couple of shows to watch them because I, they're allegories, and I want to pick apart the allegory. But I wasn't even watching this one, but I heard it, and I, my head snapped around. Whoa! That came through a network television show? How'd that happen? Humanity's greatest fear is that the truth is absolute. The ego has a hard time with the concept of any absolutes. It loves relativism. That's another part of the big trap of where we're at. Relativistic ideas. And especially when it comes to morality. We're going to talk about moral relativism. But... The concept here is natural law does not require your belief to be in effect. No more than gravity requires your belief to be in effect. Okay? It need, that needs to be understood. Human belief is completely irrelevant when it comes to the existence and operation of natural law, just as it is irrelevant in relation to any of the other laws of nature such as gravity, inertia, momentum, thermodynamics, or electromagnetism. Similar, similar to such other phenomena of nature. The workings of natural law require no belief in order for them to be discovered and known. So what I'm saying is, your belief will not change natural law. But your inquiry into it can lead to an understanding of it. You can develop the knowledge of it if you are willing to open your mind and look at how these laws function. And what we're getting as a result of our disharmony with them. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said that there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what is not true. And the other is to refuse to accept what is true. Okay? So, believing in untrue notions, which is what religion is, all forms of it, all the, the five religions I posted at the beginning of the presentation. Organized cultural religion, money, scientism, politics, and the New Age movement. There's the world religions, folks. People think of religion as only the cultural religions. No, there's four other ones. One's called government and authority, okay? Or politics, whatever, however you want to name it. The other one, is money, finance. There's another religion. One of them is the New Age movement, and one of them is scientism, which I, I'm not going to refer to as real science because it is not. It is a belief system and a religion. 
So what Kierkegaard is saying here is you can believe things that aren't true and that will hold you back. And you can refuse to accept what is true and that will also hold you back. I say these are the only two ways that humanity ever creates self-inflicted suffering for itself. You want to know how suffering is created for the human species that it doesn't need to experience? We believe what's not true, we refuse to accept what is true. That's why self-inflicted suffering exists in our species. And if we, if we are to become wise, we need to stop doing both of those things and then we'll stop creating suffering for ourselves. So let's look at consciousness and the human brain, okay? Because consciousness is an intangible force, okay? It's something that exists, but you can't really see it. Many people even have a hard time explaining what it is. But there is physiological expressions for consciousness in, in the physical domain, and the brain is one of them. And of course, people will say, well, don't leave out the heart. Of course, the heart is also very important. Heart has an even bigger electromagnetic field than the brain and is tied into the physiology in an even more complex way than the brain is. But we need to understand the basic structure of the brain to understand the types of imbalances that go on within it that lead to these debilitating conditions within humanity that continue to create suffering for us. And also, what these belief systems do is they prevent the activation of the heart and the actions, of care and action. Not only do they prevent knowledge from, real knowledge from manifesting within the being, they prevent care and they create apathy and they, they uh, create um, uh, uh, inaction, laziness, uh, uh, inaction and um, uh, cowardice so that we don't actually act and take action based upon what we've come to know. So let's look at how the brain and consciousness actually work. People will also try to give ridiculously overcomplicated and mystified definitions of what consciousness means. And many people are even scared of the term, okay? We have to demystify these terms and bring them down to real simple English and real simple concepts that the average person can grasp, okay? And stop trying to make it more complicated than it is. Being conscious of something, meaning having consciousness of it, is an ability of the being to recognize patterns. Remember, this is all about pattern recognition. To recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events that are taking place or have taken place, okay, both within oneself, okay, in the inner realm, in the, the lesser realm, the realm of the individuated consciousness, and in the realm in which the self exists and operates, the macrocosm. So let, let's break it down, right? Ability of a being to recognize patterns and meaning with respect to events taking place within oneself, the microcosm, and in the macrocosmic world, the world at large. And the events taking place is the truth. So it's our ability to accurately perceive truth of what has happened and what is happening. That's consciousness. That's consciousness. And it's, it's made way overly complicated by people. It's mostly made overly complicated in the New Age movement, again, which I, I can't stress enough how big of a deception it is. For people, really have to go and check out my work on the New Age deception, okay? It's on my website, it's uh, in the video section, and it's in the podcast section, and it's a seven-hour presentation. But I'm telling you, it will be as worthwhile for you to check out as this seminar. So, that's what consciousness is. Now, how does consciousness express? There's a difference between what it is and how it expresses in our life. Consciousness expresses. I ask people, just tell me, what are the ways you could ever make yourself known to any other being? How can any other being come to know who you are in this incarnation, in this physical manifestation? How could they possibly come to know you? How could you manifest yourself or make yourself known to them? And there's only three ways. Thoughts, emotions, and actions. Okay? And I would say speech falls into the line of the, the combination of thoughts and emotions. And speech is also a form of action. I'm using force to, you know, 
make the air flow over my vocal cords to make sounds come out so that you can hear my vo what the concepts I'm trying to express. So it is a form of action. And it derives from what we have thought up to this point and the emotions that we have, and we could express it through speech. So thought, emotion, and action. Thought you have to look at as the creative force that is the expression for consciousness within the individual. Okay? So it's a neutral force. You don't look at your thoughts as masculine or feminine, do you? But you do look at them as creative forces. In order for anything to manifest in the physical domain, it had to first exist as a thought. This computer, somebody had to envision all the parts, how it works, how it's put together. Okay? This camera equipment, the clothes you're wearing, the seats, everything that exists had to first exist in the realm of thought. Had to. By law. Then it comes into physical manifestation through action. Your emotions are a polarized component you could look at it as. It is a feminine, feminine aspect of consciousness. Because other people don't feel your emotions. They could perceive or, sen or sense them. You're the one who's feeling the emotions in your physiology. It's an internal expression. You feel emotions inwardly inside in the physiology. Hence, this is a feminine expression for consciousness. It is something that is not externalized and put out. It is something that is felt within. So the emotions in the mind-body-spirit connection are the spirit in which we do something. Okay, so that's the feminine force or the spirit. Of course, thoughts are within our mind, hence that's the mind uh, component of the consciousness. Then there's a marriage between them. Okay, so you can look at thoughts as the creative essence, which then blends with or marries to the feminine. Now, see, we're getting into a notion that is taught in all many different religious traditions. It's called the Trinity. And I challenge anybody, go and look in any of the trinities that exist, in any of the religions. You can go back to Babylon. You can go to the Indus Valley traditions. You can go to the Egyptian and Comitian traditions, the Christian traditions. Every single religious tradition that is talked of a trinity, okay, it is always a father creator, a sacred feminine figure, okay, of some kind that the father then work uh, impregnates or um, inseminates in some form, and then. From that offspring is born a male child, always, okay? What we're talking about here is the father being the mind, the creative essence, then the spirit or the emotions being the sacred feminine essence, okay? Or the Holy Spirit, the emotions, and then the child, the male child, is behavior, it is the active or masculine principle that actually interacts with the physical world to change it. And hence, that is the only way to actually save ourselves. And again, people in religious thinking will immediately attack this and say, you're saying that saving ourselves will not come through faith. Yes, I am. Saving ourselves will only come through action action will save humanity. Faith will not do it. So, sorry to, to again, smash another egoic um, attachment that people have to religious notions. But this is, these religions are created by the control system. Okay? People don't understand that exoteric Christianity is created by the dark occult of the ancient dark occult mystery schools. They don't understand where this religion came from because they haven't studied astrotheology. And I'm not telling you there's no good concepts in any religion. I say take all the good concepts and leave the nonsense. Because one of the nonsense is that you need to believe in something to, to be saved from the current human condition. You don't need to believe in a thing. You need to know the truth. And right in their own religion, there it is. Let, let me just stay on this for a moment because in their own scripture, 
the exoteric Christian scriptures, what is the one prescription that the Christ figure gives to the people when he is asked about freedom? He's only asked about freedom like once in the Gospels, okay? In the words attributed to his teachings. And they want to know what will save us, what will make us free, and what is his prescription? No, that is not. There's something missing there. You're close. What is, what is the actual saying? Know the truth. Knowing the truth will make you free. That's the prescription, even in exoteric Christianity. It's right there in the Gospels. But Christians don't want to hear that because the controllers in the church who came from the dark priest class gave them this nonsense that all you have to do is believe and everything will magically change. Well, good luck with that. When people's behaviors have no alignment with morality, you think your belief's going to change something? Again, let me know how that works out for you. And again, I'm not mincing words up here. You know, I'm telling it like it really is. I don't care who it offends. So, the expressions for consciousness are thoughts, emotions, and actions which are likened to in the consciousness community of mind, spirit, and body. And it's a trinity. A father, creator, which is the thoughts, the mind, the feminine essence, which is the, the mother of the trinity, the emotions, the inward aspects, the spirit. And then they give birth when the thoughts and the emotions come together, they give birth to action in the world, which is the male child. I, this is very important to understand. I hope everybody is clear. This is our internal trinity, which constitutes the expressions for consciousness. Okay? So let's move on. Yes. Okay, how, how, many, how much time? It is. Okay, we're going to stop right there and take a break. We'll, we, we will resume at 1.15 precisely. Okay, so you want to come in a few minutes early to get settled. I will start again at 1.15 p.m. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.